Churches are experiencing an increased attention and awareness of prayer and Jesus. Those that look after Google are saying that there's more emphasis on prayer. People are looking up prayer on Google. There's been a, a big increase in interest in prayer. And prayer is one of the things that I just want to go over with you this morning. Uh, and uh, there's a, have you ever heard of the Alpha Course? Yes. Well, this is a great course designed by Holy Trinity in Brompton. And in Holy Trinity, there's a wonderful pastor there. And he designed the course. His name's Nicky Gumbel. And uh, he tells marvellous things about what's happening there. With, uh, with the way the Lord is drawing people and the intense interest there is in their own church at Brompton. They've got 1,600 people enrolled doing the Alpha course. And this number's gone up hugely since, uh, since uh, the coronavirus. And so people are, are spiritually becoming more aware of, of the Lord. So I want to take you to a, another passage of scripture just over in Acts chapter 12. If you go there, in Acts chapter 12, just go there. I want you to go, want you to see a miracle that God did and how good God was and how much he loves his people. Hallelujah today. God is a great God. So, I'll just read a few of the verses there about this great chapter of the great miracle that God did. About that time, Herod the king stretched forth his hand to afflict and oppress and torment some who belonged to the church. And he killed James, the brother of John, with a sword. And when he saw it was pleasing to the Jews, he proceeded further and arrested Peter also. This was during the days of unleavened bread, the Passover week. And when he had seized Peter, he put him in prison and delivered him into four squads of soldiers, of four each, to guard him, purposing after the Passover to bring him forth to the people. That was some guard he had on him, 16 men, 16 burly soldiers. They must have heard that Christians had a way of escaping out of prison. So verse 5, so Peter kept, was kept in prison, but ferv- and this is what I want to just emphasize today, fervent prayer for him was persistently made to God by the church. Do you like that? What that means is they were, at, they were praying at full stretch. They were like a, the word there, if you go back to the original, it means fully stretched out, like a horse galloping. They were fervently praying and fervently seeking the Lord for the deliverance of Peter. And um, so that's something that we can remember in our praying. You know, there's nothing like being on fire and being fervent for God. Hallelujah. And, uh, you know, we're told, we're told in um, Ephesians, there, Ephesians 5, we're told to be filled with the Spirit, filled with filled with the spirit, filled with the passion of God. So Peter was kept in prison, but fervent prayer for him was persistently made to God. The very night before Herod was about to bring forth, Peter was sleeping between two soldiers, fastened with two chains, and sentries before the door were guarding the the prison. And suddenly... I like the suddenlies of God, don't you? And suddenly an angel of the Lord appeared standing beside him and a light shone in the place where he was and the angel gently smote Peter on the side and awakened him saying, get me up quickly or get up quickly and the chains fell off his hands and the angel said to him, tighten your belt and bind on your sandals and he did so. And he said to him, wrap your outer garment around you and follow me. And Peter went out along following him. And he was not conscious 
that what was apparently being done by the angel was real, but thought he was seeing a vision. When they had passed through the first guard and the second, plenty of guards, they came to the iron gate which leads into the city. Of its own accord, the gate swung open. And they went out and passed on through one street. And at once the angel left him. Then Peter came to himself and said, Now I really know and am sure that the Lord has sent his angel and delivered me from the hand of Herod and from all the Jewish people were expecting me to do to, do to me. When uh, he at a glance became aware of this, comprehending all the elements of the case, he went to the house of Mary, the mother of John, whose surname was Mark, where a large number were assembled and they were praying. Praise the Lord. Verse 13, when he knocked at the gate of the porch, a maid named Rhoda came to answer. And recognizing Peter's voice, in her joy, she failed to open the gate, but ran in and told the people that Peter was standing before the porch gate. And they said to her, you are crazy. But she persistently and strongly and confidently confirmed that it was the truth. And they said, it's his angel. But meanwhile, Peter continued knocking, and when they opened the gate and saw him, they were amazed. But motioning to them in his hand, with his hand to keep quiet and listen, he related to them how the Lord had delivered him out of the prison. And he said, report all this to James, the less, and to the brethren. Then he left and went to some other place. Now as soon as it was day, there was no small disturbance among the soldiers over what had become of Peter. And when Herod had looked for him and could not find him, he placed the guards on trial and commanded that they should be led away to execution. Then Herod went down from Judea to Caesarea and stayed on there. Well, a lot happened to Herod too because of his, his actions and so on. He lost his life because it says he did not give the glory to God. And uh, so that's something to, uh, to think about there. But just speaking of, of prayer, I wanted to share with you about the wonderful results of prayer in revival that, that, that come upon the face of the earth as the people of God pray. And I wanted, wanted you to, to know, if, you know, when we pray with intensity and, and with, with um, intention, that the Lord will really help and the Lord will really move. And do things, and I've got this book on revival here, and it's got all the different revivals that happen. And you know, there's so many great things that have happened, and all of them go back to the fact that the people prayed. They prayed to God, and uh, here in 1857, uh, there was what we call the 1857 awakening. And it has been called the prayer meeting revival. That's why I chose this today about prayer. Uh, and this prayer meeting revival was just really a wonderful movement of the Spirit of God. Let me just share with you a little bit about what it says here. It says here that God laid a call on this man called Jeremiah Lamphere an upper New York businessman converted in 1842 during a revival in the Broadway Tabernacle built by Finney. Finney, you've heard of Finney? Yeah. yeah, great, great man of God. A decade earlier, seeing the terrible need in the city of God, city for God, he gave up his business in order to be a street missionary. With Social collapse staring the city in the face. Lamphia walked the streets, passing out ads for a noonday prayer meeting to be held Wednesday at the Dutch church on the corner of Fulton Street in downtown New York. For 5, 10, 15 minutes, 25 minutes, he waited alone. His faith tried. But then at 12.30, six men came in, one after the other. The next week there were 20. By the first week in October they had decided to meet daily instead of weekly. Within six months, over 10,000 businessmen were meeting every day in similar meetings. 
confessing sin, getting saved, praying for revival. Most of the organisers of the prayer meetings were businessmen. People had meetings in stores, company buildings and churches. With hardly any exception, churches worked together as one. With no time for jealousy. By common consent, doctoral controversies were left alone. So I thought I'd just share that with you so that you could see that God in history has done some great and amazing and mighty things. Well, let me take you to another prayer. Let me take you to Chronicles. Go there, page 462 in my Bible. (laughs) pardon what's it in your bible page 462 (laughs) so I thought I'd just bring out to you uh, just something about the prayer of this man called Jabez for a moment you heard of him yes We used to have a lot of messages about Jabez, so I haven't heard about him for a while. And he was a man who really, um, who really wanted to change things. He wanted to change his life. And uh, so there in, in, in 1 Chronicles chapter 4 and verse 10, it says, Jabez cried out to the God of Israel, Oh, that you would bless me and enlarge my border and that your hand might be with me, and that you would keep me from evil, so it might not hurt me. And God granted him his request. Now there are a number of points there that we need to understand, is that Jabez, his name actually means came with pain. His name is to do with pain. And uh, I don't know how about you, whether you're suffering in your life with, with pain, but God wants to change things. God wants to take the pain away. Hallelujah. Jabez was uh, born in pain, and that's a name that his mother gave to him. Jabez cried out to the God of Israel, saying, Oh, that you would bless me and enlarge my border, and that your hand might be with me, and you would keep me from evil, so it might not hurt me. And God granted his request. Isn't it good that the Lord uh, the Lord does that here? He answers our prayer. Well, anyway, um, what I would like to say to you here is that um, you would bless me, you know. You would bless me today. God would bless you. Oh, that you would bless me. God wants to bless us. And uh, then the next little part going on from that is uh, that that you would bless me and enlarge my border. So what I want to say today is that God wants to enlarge our vision and enlarge our border. That's why I went over uh, those new things that God is enabling us to do. He's wanting to enlarge us. God's not a God of a small... He loves starting with a small thing. But he's not a God who has a small vision. So God wants to enlarge us. He wants to enlarge our borders that your hand might be with me. That's another thing that I'm happy to have in my own life. And you're happy to have, the hand of the Lord being with you. That you would keep me from evil so it might not hurt me. And God granted his request. No, nothing else is said about Jabez in the Bible apart from that. But God granted his request. So, you know, I think that's something that we can really believe the Lord for today. Something really good. Now, let's have a look at another prayer, Second Chronicles. Just go over Second Chronicles in seven, thirteen, and fourteen. Everyone should know Second Chronicles seven. I brought this out today because what it does, it talks about the. Similar conditions that we're living under today. Similar conditions to the famine or pestilence that 
that is there. So if you go to verse 13, if I shut up heaven so no rain falls, or if I command locusts to devour the land, or if I send pestilence among my people, if my people who are called by my name shall humble themselves, pray, seek, crave and require of necessity my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven, forgive their sin and heal their land. Do you like those promises? Yeah, yeah they're exciting. They're, they're wonderful. They're what God will do. And I just brought that one in this morning because it says there, if I send pestilence, among my people. And I'm not saying that God has sent the coronavirus, but he's allowed it, sovereignly he's allowed it to happen. But it says there, in times of pestilence, and that's what the coronavirus is, the pestilence, in times of pestilence, I'll heal the land. So we can believe, you know, we can really believe that God is going to do something great here. Yeah. God is going to do something great. Well, let's go to just one or two other scriptures. Well, I think before that I've got something else I wanted to just share with you about revival and how it came. So I wanted to share with you about revival coming to through prayer, coming on the Hebridean Islands. And uh, this was an area off the coast of Scotland where there was Hebridean Islands. According to the testimony of people present prior to the revival, they confessed that the churches were dead and that they were, they were in a spiritual winter. And uh, what happened was that the, the churches were so dead, people weren't interested anymore. They were going through a formality, but they were... They are not interested in the things of God. And the reason why I'm bringing out this today is that these two ladies, elderly ladies, were the people that God put his hand on to trigger off the revival. Now, God can choose anyone and move through anyone. And these people, had the, they had the time and they had the ministry of intercession. And I've written down a quote here that, is very good. It says here from a man called Walter Wink, it says here, history belongs to the intercessors who believe the future into existence. So under God, under God we can we can bring the future into existence with our intercessions. So that was really good. And uh, let me read now what were the names of these two ladies? Two ladies, Peggy and Christine Smith. What a name. Fairly common name, but they brought a fairly uncommon revival to the area. 84 years and 82 years old. Peggy was completely blind. And Christine was bent over with arthritis. They were burdened due to the depressed spiritual state in their Barvest village church. They sent the Lord speaking to them, sensed the Lord speaking to them, I will pour water on the thirsty land and streams on the dry ground. This led them to pray in their small cottage, listen to this, two to three nights a week from 10 a.m. till 3 p.m. Sorry. 10 a.m. to 3 a.m. <laughs> they weren't that, that uh, much of a prayer warrior. <laughs> uh, after several weeks of praying like this, Peggy had a vision of her church being crowded with young people and an unknown minister preaching the gospel from the pulpit. Peggy then sent for their mother, Minister, sent for their minister, Reverend Murray Mackay. She told him they sensed the Lord was going to send a revival and that he must get his church leaders and spend every Tuesday and Friday night in prayer. 
and that they would pray simultaneously in the cottage. What happened? Mackay respected his sister's judgment and the call to prayer was made. There was also a group of pastors in the region that met to discuss the spiritual declension on the island and together they composed a resolution to be read on a certain Sunday in all the free churches of Scotland. It was an appeal for all believers to view with concern the barrenness of the parishes. Though they would turn again unto the Lord, whom we have grieved with our waywardness and iniquities. It also involved asking the people to pray that the villages would be visited with a spirit of repentance. Many of the believers in the Hebrides immediately went to their knees, petitioning God to visit the islands. What happened? So I've le I'm leading out a fair bit of this. After several weeks of praying like that, one evening the minister and church leaders, including men and women, were praying in a barn. And a young leader said, Who shall ascend, read the scripture, Who shall ascend into the hill of the Lord? Who shall stand in his holy place? He that hath clean hands and a pure heart, and hath not lifted up his soul unto vanity, nor sworn deceitfully. He shall receive the blessing from the Lord and righteousness from the God of salvation. So he closed the Bible, he looked at the minister and the others and said, it seems to be so much humbug to be praying as we're praying, to be waiting as we're waiting if we are ourselves not rightly related to the God. And so, you know, a lot of things happen. A lot of things happen, but there was... A great move of God. I haven't got time this morning to, to go through it all, but they contacted a man by the name of Duncan Campbell who came to lead the revival and the whole community was dramatic. The whole community was drawn. They were drawn to the meetings and uh, they, were, they had to... Uh, People, people did not know what was happening to them, but they were drawn to come to church. At all different hours of the day, they would come seeking God. Isn't that great? Okay. It was then that Campbell witnessed many hundreds of people entering the church. No one had invited them. They had been drawn sovereignly by God. At that late hour of the evening, by 12 o'clock, the church was crowded out. Now, what I want to say to you today is that that movement of God, that spread dramatically right throughout the islands, and there was a huge turning to God, which lasted several years. So that's exciting. And uh, God can do it again, and he's such a wonderful God. So uh, perhaps we could just go to one or two more things about prayer. James 5, if you could just go over there for a second this morning. James 5. Hallelujah. I believe the Lord. I believe this is a good church of prayer. We're not, we're not preaching, you know, not telling people that they're not doing well enough in prayer. I believe it is a good prayerful church, this, this particular church. Uh, and here in verse 15 or 16, James 5, Confess to one another, therefore, your faults, your slips, your false steps, your offences and your sins and pray for one another. Hallelujah. Pray for one another. That you might be healed and restored to a spiritual tone of mind and heart. The earnest, heartfelt prayer of a righteous man makes tremendous power available, dynamic in its working. Isn't that good? Yeah. And it, we're quoted, <clears throat> last week we had Elisha, but Elijah too, Elijah, verse 17, 
Elijah was a human being with a nature such as we have, with feelings, affections, and a constitution like ours. Isn't that interesting to know? Elijah, no, we're no different. Elijah's no different to us. He's got the same weaknesses. And that great prophet of God has a constitution like ours, and he prayed earnestly for it not to rain, and no rain, rain fell on the earth for three years and six months. Isn't that amazing? And then he prayed again, and the heavens supplied rain, and the land produced its crops, as usual. So, so much for James chapter 5, but it says there in, well, actually, we, we missed out verse 14. Verse 14, it says, Is anyone among you sick? He should call for the elders of the church. And they should pray over him, anointing him in oil, with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer that is of faith will save him who is sick. And the Lord will restore him, and if he has forgiven, committed sins, they will be forgiven him. Isn't God good? Okay, so there's something about prayer there. And I think if you go to Romans 8, 26 to 27, it's how the Holy Spirit helps us in our prayer. Romans 8, 26 and 27. And it says here that the Holy Spirit comes to aid our weakness. He understands that we're human beings. In verse 26 it says, He so too the Holy Spirit comes to our aid and bears us up in our weakness, for we do not know what prayer to offer, nor how to offer it worthily as we ought, but the Spirit himself goes to meet our supplication and pleads in our behalf with unspeakable yearnings and groanings too deep for utterance. Does that ring a bell? The Holy Spirit, it says there, he intercedes for us. And verse 27, And he who searches the hearts of men knows what is the mind of the Holy Spirit what his intent is, because the Spirit intercedes and pleads before God in behalf of the saints according to an intestimony with God's will. So as we pray, the Holy Spirit is actively working in our lives. Hallelujah. And I'd notice there that not only is the Holy Spirit an intercessor for us, but also... Uh, there is the fact that Jesus it goes on later in the chapter to say that Jesus is interceding for us as well. He's at the right hand of God interceding for us. So we've got two intercessors. We've got the Holy Spirit and then we've got Jesus as well. Now just going on to another scripture. Go to Philippians. Just in Philippians there. Chapter 4, and just a little bit about prayer that Paul brings in here. Philippians 4, and verse 6. Do not fret or have any anxiety about anything. Is that comprehensive? Yeah. Right? But in every circumstance and in everything, by prayer and petition, definite requests, with thanksgiving, continue to make your wants known to God. Praise the Lord. And God's peace shall be yours that tranquil state of a soul assured of its salvation through Christ. And so fearing nothing from God and being content with its earth, earthly lot of whatever sort that is, that peace which transcends all understanding shall garrison and mount guard over your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. That's a comforting thought tonight. 
whatever is true, whatever is worthy of reverence and is honourable and seemly, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is loving, lovely and lovable, whatever is kind and winsome and gracious, if there is any virtue and excellence, if there is anything worthy of praise, think on and weigh these things and account to these things. And just going down to verse 13, while we're in the same chapter, it's so good I can't resist it. Verse 13, I have strength for all things in Christ who empowers me. I am ready for anything and equal to anything through, whom, through him who infuses inner strength into me I am self-sufficient in Christ's sufficiency. Can you say that today? I'm self-sufficient in Christ's sufficiency? Say it. I'm self-sufficient in Christ's sufficiency. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. And I just want to say how good you know, God has been to me. I just wanted to share a personal testimony of how my eyesight was being destroyed. And God raised up a wonderful, through medical science, he used medical science. But we prayed, we committed our eyes to the Lord. And I had a condition called fixed dystrophy, which I can't really explain to you today. But your know, vision goes cloudy. But God reassured us and comforted us and we sought medical help. And as a result, uh, I went through these operations and God has restored my eyesight. Praise God. So God's not limited in the method that he chooses to, to answer your prayer. But he did it. God is a good God. And just going over to one more scripture, I think we'll finish on the one more scripture. Just go to Mark 11 and 23. And this is one that you will all know. Mark 11 and verse 23. You'll all know it, but... It's the word of God and Jesus, it's Jesus talking about prayer. And um, verse 24, verse 24, Jesus teaching about prayer and he says here, for this reason I'm telling you, whatever you ask for in prayer, believe, trust and be confident that it is granted to you and you will get it. Hallelujah. Yeah. Wonderful what Jesus says about prayer. Yeah. And verse 25, whenever you... Uh, well, just going back to the verse before that, verse 22, And Jesus said to them, Have faith in God constantly. Truly I tell you, whoever says to this mountain, Be lifted up and thrown into the sea, and does not doubt at all in his heart, but believes that what he says will take place, it will be done for him. Do we believe that today? Okay. And then he says, for this reason I'm telling you, whatever you ask for in prayer, believe that it is granted to you and you will get it. And whenever you stand praying, if you have anything against anyone, forgive him and let it drop. Let it go in order that your Father who is in heaven may also forgive you. Your failings and your shortcomings, let them drop. And so Jesus said there, you know, not only do we pray, but we speak to our situation. Hallelujah. And what we do is we, we speak, if we have a problem, if we, if we have a difficulty that we're facing, we, we speak to it in the name of the Lord. And we use our authority, the authority that Jesus has given us in prayer. Jesus has given us great authority. Yeah. And he said, you know, I, I, I'm going back to heaven. I, all power in heaven and earth is given, unto, is given unto me. Go into all the world and preach the gospel. And so because of that, we can expect the Lord's power to work very powerfully in our lives. I want to finish there and leave that with you, right?